Thank you for joining Ember Genetics at the NSGC annual conference. My name is Rashid Karam, and I will be presenting with Karen Powell from Cone Health Cancer Center and Corey Jesperson from Embry. We will be talking about how to elevate the standard of care by leveraging innovation to improve the identification of patients with hereditary cancer. Disclosure, I am a full-time employee of Ember Genetics. Specifically, I'll be talking about how to improve the diagnostics of hereditary cancer with RNA genetic testing. DNA-based genetic testing may miss patients with hereditary cancer or provide inconclusive results. As you probably know, variants of a non-significance, VUS, can cause uncertainty and confusion for patients, healthcare providers, and diagnostic labs. Also, a significant proportion of patients may just test negative, regardless of having strong family history or meeting specific diagnostic criteria. This highlights the relevance, how important it is for us to invest in new technologies and in innovation. That's fundamental for us if we want to improve the detection and interpretation of variants. Today, I will be focusing on RNA sequencing, a technology that we have implemented clinically that has resulted in the, not only improving the interpretation of variants of non significance, but also in, has improved the detection of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants overall. Then I will be followed by Karen that will present a specific case where RNA sequencing was instrumental for detecting the causative variant in her patient's family. Once we identify a variant in a patient or in a family, we follow guidelines from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, to understand if that variant is pathogenic or if the variant is benign. This evidence can be computational, for example, in silico predictions, or it can be clinical, such as co-occurrence or population frequency, phenotype segregation, or it can be experimental, such as functional assays and RNA data. In the case of RNA sequencing, it provides us with RNA evidence to demonstrate whether a variant affects splicing or not. That is just a piece of the pie, if you wish, that helps us understand whether a variant is deleterious or not. But as I will be discussing today, it's a very important piece of evidence because it not only can help us to better understand the significance of a specific alteration, but it can also help us identify that alteration to start with. I'll be presenting data demonstrating how simultaneous RNA and DNA testing in 18 tumor suppressor genes associated with hereditary cancer can improve the diagnostic yield of multi-gene panel testing. The way this test works, patients are submitting two blend samples. One sample is used to isolate DNA and send it for multi-gene panel testing. The other blood sample is used to isolate RNA and that sample is sequenced in parallel with the DNA sample. Then the DNA and the RNA data are evaluated together by variant scientists, which can lead to better understand the variants of a non-significance, but also very importantly, can lead to the identification of new variants as well. All this is done on a clinical time frame with results being reported back to medical providers within 14 to 21 days. I want to spend some time to explain how RNA sequence can identify variants that may otherwise be missed by DNA-based testing. The way that multi-gene panel testing works, we have probes that will capture specific areas of the gene. Usually the areas that are captured are the coding sequences, the axons of a gene, 
Axons are usually small in size compared to the non-coding portion of the gene, the introns. Usually, axons are about 100 to 200, 300 base pairs long. So the probes will capture that specific region of the gene, and that region will be sequenced. If you have a variant there, that variant will be identified. But if the variant is located somewhere else in the gene, like in the intron, if you do not have a probe capturing that specific area, that region will, will, be not, will not be sequenced and you're not going to detect a variant that if, it's, if, if the variant is located there. So RNA can help us to detect and classify those intronic variants. Because what happens is that you are detecting transcripts, mRNAs, that are the product of splicing, right? You, as you are aware, during the process of splicing, introns are removed and the coding sequences, the axons are all that remain. But if you have a variant that it's somehow impacting splicing by creating a novel splice site or by weakening a donor splice site or a receptor splice site, that may result in an abnormal mRNA, an abnormal transcript that will be detected by RNA sequencing. And then that abnormal transcript, that abnormal RNA, will be used for us to subsequently find the variant that is located at the DNA portion. If you'd like to learn more about this specific topic, I suggest that that you read some of the several publications that are available. And I will highlight a few of them. For example, this is a publication from our group showing how RNA sequencing can help us better classify and understand the clinical significance of duplications. In this specific case, duplications in MSH2 in patients and families with Lynch syndrome. This other article published at German Network Open, it discussed how we can use RNA evidence to better classify variants detected in, in patients that were submitted to multi-gene panel testing. We, in this specific paper, looked at patients that had VUSs, mostly VUSs, that were, that were predicted to affect the splicing. And then we used RNA sequencing to better understand if that was indeed the case. That has resulted in a dramatically reduction of VUSs in this specific cohort. This next paper was published in Nature Precision Oncology. That's the paper that describes uh, the, the paired DNA and RNA sequencing approach that we have implemented clinically since last year. So this paper provides a lot of detail about how this test really works. So I strongly encourage you, if you are interested, to better understand this approach that you read these papers. All this, these three papers are all open access and freely available. And then there are papers from other groups. The previous three papers, they were all focusing on cancer. But then this one, specifically from the UCLA, it focuses on other diseases as well, and also demonstrate how whole transcriptome sequencing, a type of RNA sequencing, right? Because there are, it's important for you to understand that when we use the term RNA sequencing, it's a broad term that encompasses different technologies. You can do targeted RNA sequencing, you can do capture RNA sequencing, you can do whole transcriptome sequencing. And this is specific article at Genetics in Medicine uses whole transcriptome sequencing to demonstrate how it can improve the diagnostic yield in patients with Mendelian diseases. And this fifth paper here, I think is also very interesting, published in Nature Medicine by the by the Stephen Montgomery's group from at Stanford and the Undiagnosed Disease Network, shows how blood whole transcriptome sequencing can increase the diagnostic yield in patients that were tested negative previously, even when they did exome analysis. And this did result in an increased identification of variants that were causative. And also, I want to show you briefly some unpublished data. As I mentioned, we start performing the, the paired DNA and RNA sequencing, the RNA insight test, 
in October last year. Since then, we have tested thousands of patients. And here it's a summary of the first 30,000 patients tested. Overall, 2,000 patients were directly impacted to date. That encompasses all patients, positives, patients that got upgraded from VUS to, to clinically actionable, patients that got downgraded from VUS to benign, and also their family members, right? But I think another important metrics that it's interesting for you to take a look, it's the impact on the diagnostic yield or in the positive yield. The, uh, the, the number of pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants that were detected in addition to the ones that would have been detected if you were performing DNA testing only. And one advantage of having a large cohort is that we can actually now focus on gene-specific numbers, right? And you can see that some genes have been more affected than others. And we can see the genes that have been affected, BRCA1, BRCA2, very important genes indeed, including ATM and APC. APC is the one that I will provide, Carrie and I will provide you a specific clinical example today. In summary here, RNA sequence improves the sensitivity and the specificity clarity of DNA-based testing. It identifies more patients with hereditary cancer. It decreases VUS rates in real time and also provides more accurate results. So I, will, I would like to show you one specific case that I think is very interesting because it highlights how different pieces of evidence can all come together to solve a clinical case that has been challenging for this specific family, right? You can see here that clinically, this is a family that has uh, FAP. You can see our proband had more, had more than 100 col uh, colon polyps identified, and he had a family history as well of polyposis. You see that his, his dad had also more than 100, 100 colon polyps and had done a, co uh, a total colectomy in his 50s, and also uh, the, the family history on his paternal side is uh, it's very strong for polyposis. These are individuals that have been treated clinically as having FAP, regardless of having done previously genetic testing, and the genetic testing has always come back negative. So we, the genetic counselor sent us this family for us to perform pair DNA and RNA sequencing. And that's when we were able to identify this deep intronic variant here. You can see it's a plus 829. So that means that it, it, this variant is located in 129 nucleotides inside the intron. Right, so definitely very deep intronic and would not, not be captured if you were performing DNA sequencing alone. And it was not captured previously by DNA sequencing alone. So by using the RNA sequencing technology, we were able to identify this variant. I will show you next how we did that. So this is what we call a sashimi plot. And the sashimi plot here shows how RNA sequencing identified the inclusion of a cryptic axon in intron 8 of APC, indicating that there is a potential DNA variant there, right? How do you read this uh, a sashimi plot? You can see here that you have the peaks, and the peaks stay aligned to, uh, to an axon, to coding axon, to CDS8, right? And that's what you would expect uh, with, with normal splicing. And then this line shows this axon here being spliced to the next, next axon, which it would be expected. For example, you can look here in the control color in salmon that that's what you see in the control. You see axon 8, CDS 8 being connected. We have 441 reads showing this axon being spliced properly to CDS 9, to axon 9. But in this specific patient that we were testing in the proband, we also observed that there were reads connecting CDS8 with another area that it's located in the intron, not on a, on a, on a previously non-axon. And what this tells us as well, it's that the, co the genomic coordinates where this is happening, and this is a very important 
piece of information because it allows us to go there now. Because uh, like I said, introns are huge. You can see here uh, the, the relative size of an axon. It's, it's small compared to the size of the intron, which can, which can be thousands of KB long. So it's very hard for us to actually go there in sequence if we have no clue where to look at in the intronic area. But by having this information, this information is telling us, the, uh, this, the, the RNA sequencing data is telling us exactly where to look, what is the DNA coordinate, the genomic coordinate we should be focusing on to, to, to try to find the RNA, the DNA variant that is causative. So by having that information, we did Sanger sequencing. We went there and we sequenced that specific area of the gene. And you can see that we, by doing so, we identify this deep intronic variant, APC, C.933 plus 829 A to G. Well, again, that means that this variant, it's 829 nucleotides inside the intron, starting from the acceptor side of CDS8. And this is part of that analogy that we were saying that RNA data is just a piece of the pie. But if you think it's a very important piece of the pie, because the variant is the apple, if you wish. And if we are talking about, about an apple pie, you cannot do an apple pie. You cannot have, bake an apple pie if you do not have the apple, right? So although it's just one piece of evidence, it's a very important piece of evidence because it's providing us with the variant that after all will be subjected to the, to the evaluation for us to obtain a final classification. And then finally, this is, these are the other evidence that we were used to be able to classify, to be able to put the pie together, right? So it was identified in a family with FAP. So we had segregation data that like I showed you before as well. It was rare. It's not identified in NOMAD. The in silico predictions also indicate that this specific variable creates a strong cryptic donor site and what that's doing it's pretty much like now when the the, the splicing apparatus goes there in that area and sees that uh, that novel donor site it it gets confused and thinks oh this is actually an axon and includes that portion of the intron to the to the mrna and that will result in an out of frame transcript that will uh, lead to a loss of function allele and then finally, the, th the, the fourth piece of evidence that we use is that uh, because we did RNA sequencing, we were able to actually get the evidence supporting that, uh, those predictions to demonstrate that indeed this, uh, th this alteration does result in abnormal transcripts. So we applied uh, PS3 criteria here from the ACMG guidelines, which led us to classify this variant as pathogenic. So the key takeaways from this presentation are that paired DNA and RNA sequencing improve variant classification, and most important of all, they also increase the positive yield of genetic testing by allowing us to detect variants that would otherwise not be detected by DNA testing alone. And then I would like now to introduce Karen Powell, from Cone Health Cancer Center, she will be providing more details about the clinical management of this patient. Thank you, Dr. Karen. I'm Karen Powell. I'm a genetic counselor at Cone Health Cancer Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm honored to present our interesting patient to you all today. I do not have any financial conflicts of interest other than I'm a full-time employee of Cone Health Cancer Center. About a year ago, a 33-year-old male was referred to our clinic after having his first colonoscopy. That colonoscopy identified 100 to 150 sessile and semi-pedunculated polyps that were found throughout his entire colon. His father was seen with him at his appointment, and his father reported having polyposis on his first colonoscopy performed at age 52 that resulted in a total colectomy. His dad reports having a clinical diagnosis of FAP, but that he had never undergone genetic testing. 
Looking at the family history, they report that an uncle had polyposis with a total colectomy and that the grandmother also had colon polyps. We sent blood on the proband to Ambry Genetics using their RNA sequencing and the report identified a deep intronic variant in APC. After receiving this, this test result, we called a few labs to determine if they would also be able to pick up this variant, and they all confirmed that they would not be able to. So when talking with the family about doing family testing, we emphasized that this sample needed to be sent to a lab that could pick up this particular variant. Our fear was that they would go to their primary care physician and a sample would be sent out to a lab who may not be able to identify this variant. When doing this testing, you can see the RNA insight was, was contributing to finding this particular variant. We knew we needed to start performing cascade testing, so using AMBRI's family variant testing program, we tested the patient's uh, or the proband's father. And he also, as suspected, was found to have the likely pathogenic APC variant. The father then spoke with his family members and his sister and mother both set up appointments and came in with his sister's daughter. Again, taking, taking advantage of the family variant testing, we tested all three individuals. The sister and her daughter both tested negative, but the grandmother tested positive for the likely pathogenic APC variant. When we saw the grandmother, she reported having fewer polyps than her son or grandson. Specifically, she reported having approximately a total of 30 colon polyps. She also expanded the family history and, and identified one living sibling or one sister who had two children, one of whom had died at age 55 as a result of multiple tumors all over his body. By report, he had multiple surgeries to remove these tumors, but he died as a result of having these tumors. There's a complicated relationship between the sister and the grandmother, and the grandmother said she would not tell her sister of this result. However, the proband's father said that he would reach out to their cousin and let her know of this test result. When talking with the grandmother, she reported that her father died in the hospital from blood loss. She said that it was never determined where he was losing blood from, but that he did die from blood loss and that he had two sisters who had stomach trouble before they died. We spoke with the grandmother telling her that we suspected that this might be coming from her father's side of the family, but all of the cousins and aunts and uncles on that side of the family are now deceased. After completing testing on these extended family members, we realized that there was one family member we had not tested, which was this uncle. However, looking at our previous patients, we realized that we actually had seen him several years earlier. In October of 2013, he had come in after his first colonoscopy. He had had that colonoscopy at age 43 after his brother who was found to have polyposis and had a colectomy at age 52. We ordered a 14 gene colonex panel and found a single pathogenic MUTYH mutation. We discussed that this single mutation was not sufficient enough to cause his polyposis and that either there is an unidentified MUTYH mutation, a mutation in a totally different gene that we had not tested, or a mutation that we, in a gene that we had tested but were not able to pick up because our technology was not good enough yet. We did notice in looking back at this case is that this uncle was negative for the APC variant at that time. When the family was seen for follow-up for genetic counseling, we discussed that this was a novel mutation. To our knowledge, they were the first family to have to have this mutation found in. Based on their family history, it appears that this presents as attenuated FAP and not classic FAP. We did qualify this with the fact that this is a novel mutation and we do not know how this might present in other families. While we did not discuss this with the patient and his family, we did note that we had not performed cascade testing for the MUTYH mutation. 
Therefore, we do not know if there are other family members who are double heterozygotes for the APC and MUTYH mutation, although we suspect the uncle is a double heterozygote. Lastly, we discussed with the proband that his young children, who are ages 5 and 6, may need testing to determine if further testing was needed. Due to COVID-19, the patient's colectomy was delayed until June, and his final pathology was that he had multiple polyps throughout the colon, all less than one centimeter. We again recommended that the uncle have APC testing and ended up referring the children to a local pediatric genetics oncology center. The children were seen and underwent genetic testing. Both children tested positive for the likely pathogenic variant. The family spoke with the oncology center, and since the children were aged five and six, and therefore aging out of the time when they would have abdominal ultrasounds, coupled with the fact that there is not a family history of abdominal tumors in children or adults, the parents declined abdominal ultrasounds, but did indicate they will follow up with PEDS genetics for future follow-up of attenuated FAP. In conclusion, RNA testing identified a novel mutation in a family with polyposis and negative genetic testing in the past. This provided answers to the family for why there was polyposis and allowed them to perform cascade testing to determine who would need future follow-up. I'd like to introduce Corey Jasperson, who will continue on with this presentation. Welcome everybody to the second half of Elevating the Standard of Care. Previously, we heard about how laboratory technologies such as RNA can improve the identification of patients with hereditary cancer. In the second half, I'm going to be talking about how new service delivery models uh, that utilize AI technologies can, can be used in clinical practice to improve the identification of patients with hereditary cancer. So in the second half, I'll be talking about care in clinical practice. Care standing for comprehensive assessment, risk, and education. And my name is Corey Jasperson. I'm the Director of Clinical Services at Ambry Genetics. As a way of disclosures, uh, I am a full-time salaried employee at Ambry Genetics. However, I will not be talking about any genetic testing that Ambry offers. All right, before I jump into new service delivery models such as CARE, uh, what I wanted to do is kind of go back and kind of review a few slides on the current service delivery model in genetic counseling. That's where patients are identified in one clinic, such as in this study in 2017 from the Journal of Genetic Counseling. We had women who were identified in an imaging center. They were then referred for genetic counseling. There's around 3,000 women in this study. Uh, they identified those that actually met criteria. We're left with slightly over 600 individuals, provided them with education and a referral letter to go see a genetic counselor. Uh, and ultimately, uh, after about a, almost a year of follow-up, found that 92% of patients did not complete a genetic counseling appointment. Now, there's lots of reasons why uh, women may not actually be compliant in this setting and actually go see a genetic counselor. I won't go through a lot of those, uh, but there are a number of barriers that women may face, whether it's time travel, whether it's distance, whether it's um, cost. Uh, there's lots of various factors that could be included in why somebody may not be not compliant um, and go see a genetic counselor. In this next study out of the Journal of Clinical Oncology, uh, they focused on genetic testing in women with a history of breast or ovarian cancer, whereas the previous study had focused more on referral to genetic counseling. What this study found is, is that 80% of women with a history of breast cancer who met criteria for genetic testing did not receive that testing. Uh, There's some other highlights from this study that 1.2 to 1.3 to million individuals failed to receive the testing that they needed. And once again, this study was from 2017, so we're still seeing issues with patients are being missed. Uh, and this is for breast and ovarian cancer, where many healthcare providers understand that there is a genetic aspect to these cancers, as opposed to some of the less common cancers, such as kidney or paraganglioma, or other indications such as cardio or neuro, which would even have a lower rate of referral to genetic counseling and especially testing as well. 
So the last couple of studies highlighted a couple things. One is, is that there are currently gaps in both uh, genetic counseling uh, and testing in our current service delivery models. So now I wanted to highlight a study from the Journal of Genetic Counseling earlier this year that asked genetic counselors uh, about new service delivery models and the need for them. What this study found is that 93% of genetic counselors are interested in additional and or different service delivery models. However, three quarters of them identified barriers to implementing these new service delivery models. Now everybody's got a smartphone. Uh, that's not the uh, end solution for all of the needs for genetic testing and counseling. Uh, but what I did want to highlight is some new tools that could be implemented to help these new service delivery models, such as using smartphones, AI technologies, uh, and virtual assistants. All right, before I walk you through the CARE program, I wanted to highlight one last study called Magenta, Making Genetic Testing Accessible. I previously highlighted how the, our current service delivery model of referring to genetic counseling uh, has a number of gaps uh, and barriers. I've also highlighted how um, for even common cancers such as breast cancers, there's a significant underutilization of genetic testing. Now what I was going to highlight is the Magenta study, which aims to improve the availability of genetic testing for hereditary cancer syndromes through the use of online genetic education, testing, and results disclosure. Now, in this specific study, they're looking at online accessible genetic testing. I'm not going to advocate for or against that strategy. I'm just going to highlight this study as it brings up a couple of uh, key things to consider in, when thinking about new service delivery models. So a current service delivery model of identifying patients, referring them to genetic counseling for pre and post test genetic counseling was evaluated in a control arm uh, compared to a no counseling arm. In this study, they wanted to test whether pre and post test genetic counseling is needed to optimally deliver genetic testing. This study was actually presented at ASCO earlier this year. And what they found is, is that anxiety, depression, and decisional regret did not have a statistically significant difference across the different arms. Their conclusions from this study was electronic genetic education and results re release without genetic counseling was not inferior with regard to patient distress and was associated with higher test completion and lower, lower distress. So ultimately, us as genetic counselors may think of outside of the box about service delivery models when it comes to requiring pre and post test genetic counseling. I will make one caveat here that all patients in this arm with a positive test result did require post-test genetic counseling. However, the no counseling arm did not require pre-test and only required post-test in the other circumstances. In the last couple of slides, I've highlighted how there's a lot of interest in new service delivery models. Additionally, these new service delivery models may have a positive impact on patient care. Now, I don't know what the next five years is going to look like when we think about new service delivery models, but what I can say is, is that AI technologies are an exciting new opportunity for us, not only in the genetic space, but across healthcare overall. And we're seeing AI technologies be used in other healthcare settings. Mary Freivogel, the past president of NSGC, said in her NSGC speech, let's leverage AI, let's allow it to help, but let's remain in the driver's seat and make it work for us versus the other way around. If we fight AI, we run the risk of losing our position of power. Instead, let's embrace it and be the ones to determine its scope and set its boundaries. Additionally, a publication recently in the Journal of Genetic Counseling stated, the promise of AI technologies is to free up clinician time for the unique activities requiring a human. As genetic counselors, we often in pre-test genetic counseling go through some of the same standardized discussions with patients, what genes and hereditary are, how genetic testing might impact them and their family members. We also talk about genetic discrimination and cost of testing, insurance, whatever the case may be, some of this information could be covered by AI. And that actually might free up more of our time to focus on patient-centered care. So while efficiency is important, it's really about time created by AI interventions that should fuel more patient-centered care. All right, so let's talk about the CARE program. Once again, it stands for Comprehensive Assessment, Risk, and Education. The basis for this program is that it's an end-to-end -end solution that takes advantage of AI technologies while really utilizing the skills of genetic counselors where it's needed the most, mainly post-test genetic counseling. 
The idea behind the CARE program is, is that it includes all of the aspects as it relates to genetic counseling, education, and testing. And those key components are identifying patients at increased risk, educating patients on genes and hereditary and other aspects about genetic testing. It includes an easy to offer testing solution within a clinical practice so that the patient doesn't have to go somewhere else in order to get the testing that they need. It also includes results delivery uh, using AI technologies in addition to post-test genetic counseling through telemedicine and documenting the entire program from front to back end. Now, the CARE program can be implemented in various types of clinical settings that we've actually had difficulty getting all of these different aspects implemented in clinical practice before. So for an example, a primary care physician's office, or in the example shown earlier, um, the imaging center where patients are going in potentially to get a mammogram, for example. These have been uh, areas of clinical settings that we've had a difficult time getting identification uh, implemented in, let alone identification, education, and testing into those clinical settings. And that's why the CARE program was developed. So let's talk about identification. Some of the key considerations when we're thinking about identification is, is that there should be consistency across clinics. Currently, when you think about a healthcare system, you might actually have a patient going into their PCP's office. That PCP's office may only refer over to genetic counseling. Those patients that are at very high risk. They have lots of cancers going on at young ages, various cancer types, something that's really obvious to that clinician in general. Whereas if you go to another clinic setting, such as in an imaging center, they may not be doing anything except for evaluating whether or not there's an increased risk for breast cancer. They may not be, re they may not be referring patients over to a genetic counselor. And so consistency across clinics is important so that patients aren't getting treated differently in the imaging center than they are in their primary care physician's office. They're getting evaluated the same regardless of what kind of clinic they're going into. Efficiency, as I mentioned before, very important, although it's not the key component to any one particular program. Patient-centered care is the ultimate thing that we're looking for in any type of genetic program overall. But efficiency is necessary so that you can implement a genetics program into a clinic that actually has a high patient volume, such as a urologist's office or a primary care physician's office, as I mentioned earlier. And logistics is also important. We need to figure out the best method for communicating with patients. Um, and also doing so in a way that actually benefits the patients so that they can actually get that information to their healthcare provider prior to them ever going and seeing them. So when we think about how to communicate with patients, we all know that patients have mobile phones, they're checking their emails and their text messages. So communicating with patients via email and text is actually really important. And that's what the CARE program does. Now shown on the right side here is a virtual assistant often called the chatbot. And actually, as I'm talking with you, you'll see on the right hand side, the virtual assistant is asking patients questions about their personal and family history. So the virtual assistant is really utilizing uh, NCCN guidelines that we've uh, evaluated and incorporated into the CARE program to evaluate the standard guidelines for genetic testing and counseling. This information is collected and turned into a clinic summary report so that the physician has access to whether or not the patient meets guidelines and actually is at increased risk for various cancers, such as breast cancer using Tyracusic models. So it's important that any type of program documents this collection of personal and family history in a consistent method. And as you can see here, if somebody does meet NCCN guidelines, we highlight what specific guidelines are met. For patients in the CARE program that meet NCCN guidelines, we offer all of them pre-test education via our virtual assistant. The virtual assistant is able to cover basic elements for informed consent, tell patients about genes and hereditary, what genetic testing is, how it might impact them and their family members, cost of testing, insurance coverage, genetic information, some of the basic elements that we frequently cover during pre-test genetic counseling. One of the benefits of virtual assistance is we're able to provide information via images for those visual learners, 
We also have text for those that actually learn via reading, and we have videos for those who are both visual and auditory learners. Local GCs can be involved in this process, although pre-test genetic counseling is not a requirement. For patients who meet NCCN guidelines, it's important that they have the opportunity to get tested at the time of their appointment. And this happens through a provider portal. So when the patient goes and meets with their physician, the physician can actually view all of their patients coming in that day, determine whether or not the risk assessment's been completed, whether or not NCCN guidelines are met. And if the patient elects to proceed with testing, the physician can order it using the button on the right. That prompts uh, an ordering page where patients or providers can actually search for the appropriate genetic test, uh, can actually order the test on the spot and collect the specimen and send it in. Results delivery is a really key component of the CARE program and any other program like it. The reason why is, is that physicians need assistance with getting results to patients and having them counseled appropriately. Patients want the ability to schedule appointments or get the results easily, and this is accomplished in the CARE program through a number of different ways. First is through the CARE patient portal. This is where patients can actually get access to their genetic test results, but only after they've been disclosed. So for negative and US results, those patients can get their results first through the virtual assistant and then have an opportunity to meet with a genetic counselor. For positive patients, all of those individuals must meet with a genetic counselor first, typically using our telemedicine uh, genetic counseling service before they can actually get copies of their results. This can be done through either phone-based or local GC results disclosure. Once again, positive results uh, automatically trigger post-test counseling. And you can see here where the patient can schedule a genetic counseling appointment right from their phone using the virtual assistant. And then lastly, patients have access to the results in the portal following the disclosures. Documentation is also a critical component of the care program. Uh, it's important that the end-to-end -end documentation, whether it's the risk assessment, the clinic summary, the GC notes, be available to both the patients and the providers. And in this setting, you can see in this provider portal, all of the documentation shown here on the right, here are some of the key examples with a chatbot transcript, also the virtual assistant transcript, and on the right, the clinic summary, highlighting what guidelines were met or what guidelines were not met. And there's also a patient portal where they can get access, where patients can get access to this information as well. All right, now that I'm giving a high level overview of what the care program is, I'd like to look at some data about what we've seen so far. Uh, a couple of things to note first. One is, is that these data is only from the first, on average, three months of starting the CARE program. Additionally, we primarily implemented the CARE program in settings that had no tools in place for identifying patients at increased risk, and they also had no tools for educating or testing them as well. So far, we've assessed 20,000 patients with a virtual assistant. We have a 72% completion rate. The reason our completion rate is fairly high is, is because we're using both email and text invitations to patients. Once again, getting the right logistics in place in a program, figuring out the right way of interacting with patients is a key component. Using standardized NCCN guidelines, we found that 34% met genetic testing criteria and ultimately 44% of patients opted to proceed with testing. So the CARE program has had a significant impact on clinical care just in the first three months of its launch. So what are some of our key takeaways? Well, service delivery models of genetic counseling are rapidly evolving and effective tools are needed to keep pace and address barriers. AI can provide efficient and consistent means to performing genetic risk assessment. And the most effective end-to-end -end solutions like the CARO program uh, that utilize genetic risk assessment will include both AI and the human touch and skills of genetic counselors. 
All right, so I just have a few additional takeaways. Uh, first is, is that genetic counselors can really be champions of programs like CARE. Uh, not only can they be champions, they should be champions. Uh, these types of programs aren't going to replace genetic counselors. What they're really going to do is really target the skills of genetic counselors and utilize them where it's needed the most in post-test counseling. I'm not saying that genetic counseling pre-test is not important and shouldn't be utilized, but in programs where we start to implement care into other settings like primary care physicians' offices, a new service delivery model should be considered. Additionally, care programs can actually be really integral to population health initiatives. The reason being is, is that health systems across the U.S. are looking for opportunities to implement population health initiatives. And CARE is really about identifying, educating, testing, and providing counseling to patients that need it the most. And therefore, we're implementing genetics at a much larger scale than we've been able to do so before. And lastly, and most importantly, chatbots can't replace genetic counselors. Once again, these programs are not here to replace genetic counselors. They're really about utilizing the skills of genetic counselors where they're needed the most. I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at the email provided on this slide and here are my references. Thank you very much.